Okay, uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we're gonna start. So um, it's a, it is my great pleasure to uh, and privilege to introduce you today, our, our speaker today. So our speaker is Dr. Jean-Philippe Chaput. Uh, Jean-Philippe Chaput is a, is a senior uh, research scientist at the uh, Eastern Ontario Children's Hospital Research Institute in Ottawa, where he works with the uh, Healthy Active Living and Obesity Research Group. Uh, Dr. Chapu is also an associate professor at, in the Department of Pediatrics at University of Ottawa. So uh, Jean-Philippe Chapu did uh, completed his training first at the University of Sherbrooke, where he did his bachelor and master's in kinesiology. Then he completed his PhD in kinesiology at University Laval, and then a postdoc fellowship uh, in human nutrition at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. So uh, Dr. Chaput uh, has been appointed at University of Ottawa and uh, the, the Children's Hospital uh, of Eastern Ontario Research Institute since 2010. And uh, his research interests are in the epidemiology and public health aspects of sleep and other lifestyle behaviors such as screen time and physical activity. Uh, he's published uh, uh, an impressive number of publications over the years uh, more than 350 scientific articles, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, very impressive for uh, not uh, a young, uh, not a young uh, an early career researcher anymore, but a mid-career researcher. Um, so Jean-Philippe serves on many uh, editorial boards and advisory commitments, and uh, he's also uh, often uh, solicited to give uh, conferences and and keynotes around the world. So it's really a pleasure to have him with us today. And he's going to talk about assessing steep health and how uh, is time well spent. That's the title of his presentation. So Jean-Philippe, it's, uh, it's your, please, uh, you could start now. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, intro, Tan. Um, yeah, welcome everyone from Chelsea. Uh, my house is in Chelsea, still working from home near Gatineau, Ottawa. And maybe just before getting started, I didn't know that Tan was uh, the moderator or the chair of this session today. And I think the first time I met him was in 2015 uh, at the Canadian Sleep Society Conference. And we both won the New Investigator Award the same year or so normally they give one per year but that year they gave two I guess they thought that we're both very good so uh, that was the first time I met him so I'm very happy that uh, he's uh, moderating this session today so good to see you uh, yes as he was saying I think my talk today will be around sleep health I think we can all relate to sleep we sleep about one third of our lives so I think uh, we can't escape that. So that's a topic that interests everyone. We could talk about nutrition or stuff like that. We all have to eat, but I think sleep is something that uh, we all do and we need to do to survive. And I think uh, I think we probably could do better uh, as well. And there's many aspects. I will not cover everything in 40, 45 minutes. I'll leave uh, lots of time for questions because every time I talk on this topic, I think uh, people have many questions. So I think uh, it's important to leave time for that. So just before getting started, I just want to say I have no conflicts of interest disclosed. Uh, as Tan was saying, I'm Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Ottawa for the past 11 years now, time flies quickly, and also a senior scientist at the Chiu Research Institute, which is a pediatric hospital in Ottawa. And this is a picture in Banff at that conference a couple of years ago with uh, Mark Tremblay, who was a director of our group. And uh, as of this year, I'm the new director, so I guess... Uh, things change at some point and uh, uh, so it's a, a new role for me, a new challenge. So I think we all relate to, to sleep in our lives and I think uh, when we have a good night's sleep we just feel better. I think when we think about uh, our mood, emotions, stuff like that. So I think uh, every, I could ask you what's your optimal uh, number of hours per night you prefer to, to sleep and that number can be all different between you so i think there's no magical number number that applies to all but i think the public health guidelines they say for adults between seven to nine hours per night of sleep so i think most canadians should fit within seven to nine and i'll show you some data showing that there's still quite a bit of people that don't sleep enough so when we look at canadian data 
uh, for Canadian children and adult adolescents, it's about one third of children and adolescents who sleep less than recommended for health. So for school age children, the recommendations are between nine and 11 hours per night and for adolescents between eight and 10 hours. So one third sleep less than that. And the long sleepers, those sleeping more than the upper limit, it's about 1% of Canadians. So the long sleepers don't really exist as it relates to pediatric population in Canada. And the problem is more with lack of sleep or short sleep duration. No differences between boys and girls so that, that applies to both boys boys and girls. What we see, we also see some catch up sleep on the weekend. So, and a, a bit more for teenagers. So one hour, one hour and a half more on weekend days, so Saturdays and Sundays compared to weekdays, uh, because we know that there's a shift in their sleep wake cycle of teenagers. It's normal for them to go to bed late and wake up late. And on weekdays, you have to wake up to go to school. So sometimes they, they, they catch up on the, on the weekend. For adults, it's also very similar. About one third of adults uh, sleep uh, are considered short sleepers, so sleep less than seven hours per night. Um, and the long sleepers for older adults, 65 years or more, it's about 15%, so a bit more. So the recommendations for adults, seven to nine, and for older adults is seven to eight. And yes, this is duration, but sleep quality is very important as well. And about half of Canadians report trouble going to sleep or staying asleep sometimes, most of the time, all of the time. It doesn't mean it's a sleep disorder like an insomnia, but at least uh, they report poor sleep health or uh, they could improve their, their sleep patterns. The recommendations we have in Canada are part of the Canadian 24 hour movement guidelines. So they're embedded with the physical activity and the center behavior guidelines uh, since 2016. Um, so you can see the sleep duration recommendations for public health guidance uh, from newborns and in more sleep, of course, because they are growing up to adults and older adults, so adults seven to nine hours per night. And of course, as I was saying, uh, we can see large variation between people. It's in, explained by many factors, uh, including our genetic makeup. So some people may cope very well with six hours per night, and some may need more than nine as well. So we're all different. But for most Canadians, for public health guidance, we need to be roughly between seven to nine hours. But uh, for clinical practice, I think we need to adapt that on a case by case basis because we're all different. So this is more for surveillance in Canada and what we can see in the in the population. And if we think about uh, athletes, for example, like Roger Federer uh, reports sleeping 12 hours per day. So there are many athletes sleeping way more than nine hours per day. They're napping because they're training a lot. So I think uh, uh, there's many things that can uh, that can happen. So we're seeing that in Canada, the sleep duration recommendations are part of the Canadian 24 hour movement guidelines. So that, that was released for the first time in 2016 for children and youth, so five to 17 years of age. Uh, so you can see in the middle, it's sleep. Uh, that was a partnership between, so the funder was the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, participation was involved for the dissemination of that. And the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology are the owners of the guidelines. And they were other partners, the Conference Board of Canada and uh, CHIO, our group at CHIO doing uh, the science behind those guidelines to come up with uh, systematic reviews to inform the, the guidelines, stakeholder consultation, uh, expert con con consensus and so on and so forth. So uh, sleep is the, the middle one, and you can find that uh, easily online. There are scientific papers that helped inform those guidelines, and also there's many uh, material that you can use either for social media, for presentation, and stuff like that. So roughly this slide, what you can see here, took about two years and $1.5 million. So there's a lot of work behind the scene that you don't see in that one slide, but just to say that to follow robust clinical practice guidelines, it takes time. We need to follow uh, the agreed to protocol, you grading the evidence. There's a lot of boxes to be checked. So it seems pretty easy, but it's, it's a very long process. And translate everything into French and stuff like that as well. So that was in 2016. And then in 2017, we released the, uh, the guidelines for the early years, zero to four, and sleep was part of that as well. Uh, and as you can see, the 
the sleep duration recommendation are well aligned with those that we have in the US from the National Sleep Foundation. So at least, which is good with, uh, with guidelines, you, you don't want to have different recommendations for, for different countries. I think in an ideal world, we would like the WHO to have uh, global guidelines on sleep so that could apply to the world because otherwise the risk is that uh, 20 countries come up with sleep guidelines with all different ranges or recommendations. So it's, it's, it's sending a mixed message, a mixed message to, to people when all the numbers don't, don't align. Even though we're all based on the same science, it can be different experts at the, at the table. So we can in, in, interpret the same science different ways. So it's never black or white in science. It's always shade, shades of gray. So it can impact. And last year in November 2020, uh, we released uh, the adult guidelines. So the the 18, 64, and 65 plus. Uh, so we have the full suite of guidelines for the across the life cycle in, in Canadians. Uh, and you can see, I can just read for the 65 plus is getting seven to eight hours of good quality sleep on a regular basis with consistent bed and wake up time. So it's not just sleep duration, but it talks about quality, it talks about uh, Con con consistency in your sleep. So it's not just one day of the week or two days of the week. So the many aspects when we uh, will talk about sleep health. So it's not just amount, but quality, timing, and all of those things matter uh, for health. Same with physical activity. It's not just how many hours or minutes per day do you move, but do you move every day? What type of exercise? How in intense it is? So sleep is the similar as well. There's many aspects of it that all together, we know if it's good sleep or bad sleep. And it's just one one dimension or one characteristic and we're seeing at the bottom that if you progress towards any of these targets will result in some health benefits so the goal is not just at attain this threshold or this this benchmark but it's a progression towards it the same for physical activity or to reduce screen time and stuff like that in your life so i think the health benefits are not achieved just with that threshold yes or no but it's a it's a continuum that can impact health so why do we sleep less today compared to uh, decades ago? For different reasons, we've seen a decline in sleep duration if you look at the past 40 years in many countries, especially in teenagers. If you look at all age group, teenagers is the one with the steepest decline in sleep duration. Uh, screen time is one key factor. We can talk about the blue light that can impact uh, sleep, but other factors as well. But screen time has been one of the contributing factors. Artificial light, the fact that we have lights everywhere in the 24 seven society. Uh, so it's, it, it's a bit more difficult to, to sleep. So we use lights to keep animals awake, but it seems to work with humans as well. And I think a key factor to me, uh, yes, of course, the fact that we work too much and stuff like that, but I think uh, we don't take sleep ser seriously in our work obsessed society. So I think uh, we see sleep as a waste of time. So um, I will sleep when I'm dead. So many people think that as long as I eat well, I move, so I don't, I don't need to care about my, my sleep. So no, I would say that sleep is as important as eating well and moving in the package for good health. So I think we need to prioritize more sleep in our society. And if you look at some other countries in Asia, for example, it's pretty common to see sleeping pods in the workplace. They value, they value napping and stuff like that. But here, I think uh, people napping, we tend to see them as lazy people and they, they, are, uh, they don't, don't, don't want to work. So I think the way we see sleep can be very different depending on your culture or the way you are in, in the world. So I think there's still a lot of uh, advocacy work to do to put sleep on the mat to the same extent as diet and exercise in the package for good health. Uh, there's a lot of love studies going on uh, looking at the effects of the blue light on sleep patterns of people and how can we cope with that. For example, uh, you, you can have a night shift mode in your iPhone that can block the blue light or people. you have, you have people with sunglasses. I think the evidence can be a bit mixed, but I think what we see is that it goes to the brain and then it can delay sleep onset uh, and reduce sleep quality at night. So we need to learn more about that. But the fact that we all use our screens all the time now compared to many years ago, so we all have cell phones, tablets. Uh, so we use our screens a lot, watching TV and stuff like that. So I think it has an impact on our health, the screen time part, but also on our sleep patterns as well. So uh, there is a way to, to go around it. In terms of COVID, so that's something that uh, 
question I receive pretty often. So what was the impact of COVID on sleep? So I think if you look uh, uh, since March 2020, the impact of COVID on many behaviors, you've seen studies coming out that people move less or decline in physical activity, in, increase in screen time, increase in stress, anxiety, and stuff like that, uh, drinking more, more beer and wine. But for sleep, it has some, uh, some good and bad things, I think I will say. Uh, they were both positive and negative changes to sleep patterns. I think for me, for example, working from home, it, it was a good thing, COVID, as it relates to my sleep, because I'm more flexible in my schedule. I probably save one hour and a half of, of commute per day with pickups and drop off of my daughter at, at daycare. It's much easier now. I can just walk. It's easy. I don't have to stress about coming back in traffic. So I think for people working from home, it has had a positive impact on their sleep. For some other people uh, with the worries, anxiety, and stress, it has a negative impact on their sleep. So we've seen different response in the Canadian population as a result of COVID. Uh, we've seen that shift uh, later in our sleep pattern too, also with school closures. Uh, so teenagers were going to bed later, waking up later, and the neg negative impacts were greater uh, in adolescents compared to, to children in many of the Canadian studies that look at that. When we think about insufficient sleep, so both in terms of duration or quality are both associated with a, a long list of adverse health outcomes in epidemiological studies. So more weight gain seen in short sleepers, uh, risk of type two di di diabetes, cardiovascular disease, mortality, uh, unhealthy behaviors. So people tend to be more inactive when they don't sleep enough because you feel more tired. You may be less likely or prone to go to the gym or to be active when you don't sleep enough. Uh, more screen time. We tend to sit more when we don't sleep enough. Un unhealthy eating behaviors. So if you restrict sleep of people and you put them in an, in an fMRI machine, you look at their brain, it looks a bit like a Christmas tree. So we crave more for food high in fat, high in sugar. So we want to eat poutine, pizza, shawarma but not fruits and veggie so it's a reward for the brain uh, it impacts our mood as well emotions we don't sleep enough so more al al alcohol intake as well when we don't sleep enough so beer liquor and wine it impacts also mental health anxiety and depression symptoms irritability uh, suicide risky behaviors you can think about drowsy driving uh, in injuries in the workplace weaker immune system impact grades, uh, cognitive functions, quality of life, well-being, and the list goes on and on. So I think uh, sleeping well should be part of the package for good health. I think we need to see the adverse effects of chronic lack of sleep on health rather than acute effects, because what studies tend to show if, let's say, one day per week, you don't sleep enough for whatever the reason, and then if the after that you sleep okay, so things tend to come back to normal. So if you look at the hormones, whatever, but if five days of the week you don't sleep enough and you just catch up on Saturdays and Sundays, uh, that's a chronic effect of lack of sleep. So down the road, it may impact your, your health. So I think, uh, I think we need to think more about the, the adverse effect of chronic lack of sleep uh, over time. Uh, when we look at sleep duration and different health outcomes, so you can put any health outcomes on the y-axis here, what we tend to see in, in ep epidemiological studies is a U-shaped association with both short sleep and long sleep associated with adverse health outcomes, <clears throat> with an optimum in adult around seven to eight hours uh, of sleep per night for the prevention of chronic diseases. Uh, what we tend to use in epidemiology for the most part is self-reported sleep. So it tends to have misclassification and errors. So I think in more most recent studies where we use an objective measure of sleep, like risk actigraphy, we tend not to see quite a bit of a U-shape association, but it's more lack of sleep that a stressor or a problem for the body, and long sleep is less of a problem. And also when we control for confounding factors such as depression symptoms, chronic pain, or stuff like that, so the long sleep peak tend to disappear as well. So I think. To me, it makes sense to have a range of sleep duration for public health guidance. So let's say seven to nine hours roughly per night. Uh, but the long sleep, if you look at uh, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, there's no upper limit in their guidelines. They say adults should sleep seven hours or more. So they don't have the nine hours upper limit. 
but at the same time, if someone sees 15 hours per night, I think it may probably a red flag. So there's probably something wrong going on. And if you see 15 hours per night, uh, you probably have poor sleep quality. So you may spend a lot of time in bed, but not being very, very efficient in your sleep. <clears throat> so at least it can signal the clinician that maybe there's other underlying issues to be addressed. So I think having a cap on long sleep just uh, to signal the, the clinician that maybe something else is going wrong is, is a good thing. But long sink per se is not, it's not a bad thing. Uh, I did a, quite a bit of work in the relationship between sleep and obesity and weight gain. So I think it's on both sides. So both lack of sleep can lead to weight gain over time because we know from systematic reviews and meta-analysis that short sleepers, so let's say adults sleeping less than seven hours per night, eat about 350 calories more per day compared to long sleepers. So we eat more by sleeping less, but also excess weight can also impact sleep. So we know, for example, with obstructive sleep apnea. So of course it really, it's gonna reduce your sleep quality. So it's on both sides and it can create a, a, a vicious circle here. And in this field of sleep and obesity, it's not only a prospective court study showing that short sleep duration is associated with the weight gain over time, but there's also a randomized control trial that that really shows a cause and effect association. So I just show one here where uh, adults were subject to 225 adults in a lab setting. So five nights of four hours in bed versus five nights of seven to nine hours in bed. So with that week of uh, four hours in bed, they gained one kilo, so two pounds more than the controls. And they ate more 130% of their daily caloric requirements and mainly during late night hours. So 550 calories more <clears throat> during late night hours. So it was really due to an increase in food intake by the fact that we're spending more hours awake. And also uh, we just feel more hungry when we don't sleep enough. So when I try to explain a bit the mechanism that can explain why lack of sleep can lead to weight gain over time. So the main explanation is this through an increase in food intake because you're awake for more hours. So there's a direct correlation between hours awake and calories consumed. So you just have more time to go to the fridge, to go to the cookie jar when you don't sleep enough. So that doesn't mean that you're more hungry, but just by being awake longer, you have more opportunities and chances to eat. But also we know that it triggers many hormones, appetite hormones in the body like cortisol, leptin, ghrelin, that also increases drive to eat. So both together increase drive to eat and more time to eat. Uh, so we're more likely to snack. And also for some people it can impact their energy expenditure by being more tired. Uh, you may want to sit more and engage in more screen time so it can reduce your energy expenditure. Uh, but overall, the, the mediator is really to an increase in food intake that leads to a positive caloric balance and weight gain over time. <clears throat> also, we've done some studies. Okay, so we know that lack of sleep is bad for health. Lack of sleep can lead to weight gain. What if I change my poor sleeping habits into good ones? Can I improve my weight? So in one of this study, so the control group were adults sleeping the good zone, seven to nine hours per night. Those in the middle that were short sleepers that slept more from six hours per night to seven to nine. And then on the right hand was the chronic short sleepers, those who maintain their, their short sleeping habits over time. And the chronic short sleepers gain way more body fat than those who increase their sleep. So two take home messages here. So it's possible to change bad sleeping habits into good sleeping habits. And by doing so, you know, induce weight loss but you prevent future weight gain. And also when we talk about uh, the treatment or the management of obesity, uh, sleep is not now part of uh, the guidelines for in Obesity Canada for uh, addressing the management of obesity because we need to ask many questions, not just about that exercise, medication, stuff like that, but we want to address the root causes of the problem. So if you want to understand why some people eat too much and why they don't move enough, lack of sleep can be one of those drivers. So it's important to asset, look at the big picture, look at all the, the key drivers. And I think uh, it's good that we now ask questions about sleep because it's, it's a key aspect of our lives that can impact many uh, behaviors, including food intake and physical activity. So in the field of health and wellness in the past couple of decades, I think the two main pillars that were put forward to explain the 
the higher prevalence of chronic diseases, obesity around the world was mainly diet and exercise. And I think more and more we see uh, sleep in the public health arena, which is a good thing because it can impact eating behaviors and physical activity behaviors, but we still have work to do. I think uh, it's not recognized to the same extent as uh, nutrition and physical activity, especially by the Global Burden of Disease Study, which is the largest epidemiological study. Uh, you can, at the, the Lancet, they just published a, a series of, of papers on that, and they list all of the risk factors, smoking, obesity, unhealthy diet, but sleep is not even part of this list. I think we have work to do as scientists in the field of sleep to put sleep on the map a bit more. So to convince policymakers that uh, investing in sleep is good. So I think to better quantify the, uh, the burden of, insuff of insufficient sleep on uh, the economy, on healthcare and so on and so forth will help to put that on the map of risk factors because I think if it's not even recognized as a key risk factor, it's tough to justify uh, allocating money to this, to this problem. And I think, uh, so we need to realize, of course, it's a myth that sleep is a waste of time and a good diet and exercise can offset sleep deprivation. So I think uh, every, it, when we talk about health, it's a package. There's many, many things that can impact health and we need to sustain good behaviors over time. So things can change as well. And to me, it makes a lot of sense to have the seed uh, recommendation as part of the physical activity guidelines in Canada, because those behaviors are all interrelated. So if you don't sleep enough, you're less likely to move. If you're very active, you'll, you're going to sleep better. And there's an association with screen time as well. So too much screen time before bed, you're not going to sleep as well. And if you don't sleep, you engage more screen time. So, and there's a, there's a give and take. So if you add up physical activity, center behavior and sleep, it's 24 hours. So from a time displacement uh, hypothesis, it makes sense to keep them together. So if we tell people to move more, but by saying that, they just wake up earlier in the morning, so they give up on their sleep to move more. The effects on health will not be as good as if they were giving up screen time or sitting. So what you add or what you remove from your glass, which is full at 24 hours, uh, will have impacts. So I think that's why to have a, this uh, holistic approach is more important than just looking in silos at all of those behaviors because they're all interrelated. They, they have interconnections. Uh, a bit of history about sleep medicine. So the, fo the focus of uh, sleep medicine has been mainly on the identification and treatment of sleep disorders. So going to sleep conferences, for example, it's mainly about sleep disorders or the treatment. Uh, so it came from the field of medicine. So no, no big surprise here. So this uh, medicalization of sleep is not surprising and followed other disciplines with a... Uh, a focus on diseases, disorders, and their treatment. But I think there's a more and more interest in health promotion for all. So for everyone, not just people with a sleep disorder, but keeping healthy people healthy. So the prevention side of it, and that's where the term sleep health came. So to allow prevention and treatment to be hand, hand in hand, and not just the treatment of sleep disorders, which is a small segment of the population. But now we look at 100% of the population in Canada or the world. So the concept of sleep health. So mainly it's a term that embraces a holistic vision of health and provides a metric uh, for health promotion efforts at the individual and population level and allows, as I said, prevention and treatment to be integrated in order to facilitate a common vision of improving sleep and different health outcomes. So uh, we have different sleep dimensions, as I mentioned. So it can be, are you satisfied satisfied with your sleep, uh, daytime alertness, the timing of your sleep. So for the same amount of sleep, you may want to go to bed later and wake up later or go to bed early and wake up early. When you, you think about the chronotype of people, we're all different. So the morning uh, larks or the night owls. Uh, efficiency, so sleep quality is important, duration. So all of those aspects matter. And they will impact genetic, epigenetic, and molecular and cellular processes to impact systems, to impact health, disease, and function. So it started uh, by Daniel Buis uh, in 2014, was adapted, I think, this year for the pediatric population, which is good because I work at CHU in Ottawa. 
And I think uh, I really like this concept because it's, it just embraces all aspects of sleep and also for everyone and not just for those with sleep disorders. And one of my colleagues, a uh, couple of my colleagues in Ottawa were asking me, I'm a clinician. I don't have a lot of time when I see a patient. So I have maybe 30 seconds, one minute. JP, can you come up with a very short uh, screening assessments? I want to know if my patient has good sleep or bad sleep, but I want validated questions. And if I look at all the sleep questionnaires are pretty long. So uh, they don't have five minutes to spend just on sleep. So uh, with one of my colleague, uh, Judy, we came up, uh, we did a review of the different questionnaires and tried to come up with six simple questions that can be used by busy clinicians and clinic to assess five uh, key sleep characteristics. So question one addresses sleep duration, question two, sleep quality, question three, sleep timing, question four, daytime alertness, and question five and six, a quick uh, screen for a possible sleep disorder, so insomnia and obstructive sleep apnea, the, the two key ones that you may find. So at least it gives a good snapshot of on, on whether it's, it's good sleep or bad sleep. And it's one thing to work with uh, people in clinic or to try to change sleep of people, but I think what we also need, it, it needs to become easier for people. So when we talk in, in obesity, make the healthy choice easy for people. So if it's very cheap or easy to buy junk food, people will do that. But if fruits and veggies are super cheap, they're easy to find everywhere. So it may change behaviors. So same with sleep as well. So make it easy for people that uh, good night's sleep uh, is a default. So I think that we need also top-down policies at the government level to help people have a better night's sleep. So, and I was giving a couple of examples in, the, in that paper of things that could be done. It was in the, geared more toward the pediatric population because of that paper. So some examples are, I'm just taking time if I'm okay, okay. Uh, to delay school start time for adolescents because we know that uh, it's normal for them to go to bed later and wake up later. And the recommendation by most experts is uh, a high school should not start before 8.30 in the morning. Uh, so, so I think it makes sense. In Canada, it's not too bad. I think on average, uh, high school start at 8.30, 8.45. But there are some schools in the U.S. They start at 7 or 7.15 a.m. It's way too early. Uh, eliminate daylight saving time. So we just, uh, we're back to standard time now, but in March we'll be back to daylight saving time. So every year we talk about it. I think the, there's bills in Ontario, there's bills in, in many provinces. I think we need to all follow suit, uh, but I think most countries of the world don't have that. And I think it's a matter of time that we will eliminate daylight saving time. It creates more complexity uh, to regulate extracurricular activities that it doesn't end after eight uh, after nine p.m. So it allows teenagers to come back home, and then of course, if you come back after hockey practice, you don't feel like going to bed right 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 away. So you need to wind down and be able to go to bed. Blocking the blue light of screen, so companies should have that in their uh, in their screen. So we have that, for example, in the setting of iPhones. Uh, so the, the night shift mode, but I think it, it should be, it should, the company should do that for all their devices to block the blue light of screens, to regulate the uh, sleep in childcare settings. So uh, napping in childcare setting is very different. Uh, my daughter has been to four or five different daycares, and I think uh, the practice about napping is very di different at all daycares. So I think we need more regulation. We probably need a, a position statement with the Canadian Sleep Society about napping. So what do we recommend as us as a sleep, sleep experts? And then the government can, can make some regulations. Uh, and we need to talk about sleep at school as well. The, the ABCs of sleep, I think we talk about many, many things. The diet, uh, we need, we need they, they talk about physical activity, but I think we don't talk they don't talk much about sleep. So I think uh, it should be part of the education to educate our, our kids and the new generation about the benefits of a good night's sleep for health and wellness. It's only since 2016 that we have our own sleep guidelines as part of the 24 guidelines. And I was seeing that that triangle, that all of those three behaviors, they, they, they interact with each, with each other. So it makes sense to have them together as opposed to have just sleep guidelines. 
And as you know, there's many tips for sleep. So we should all go to bed and wake up at the same time every day, even on the weekends. But no one is perfect, of course. And as I said, it's more the adverse effects of chronic lack of sleep as opposed to uh, having bad sleep one or two nights a week. I think no one is perfect. I'm, I'm not. I don't have a perfect sleep every night as well. But I think it's the, the cocktail of good behaviors that you can sustain over time that will impact your health. Avoid caffeine consumption starting in the late afternoon because it can impact your sleep. Avoid drinking alcohol in the evening. It can help you to fall asleep, but then the second half of your night, uh, you're going to uh, have a disturbed sleep. Avoid smoking cigarettes. So smoking is bad for health, but also it's a stimulant, so it, uh, it goes against sleep. Uh, expose, go outside. Expose yourself to the sun uh, as much as possible, especially in the, in the morning. That's why winter time, when it's more dark, uh, it impacts our mood as well. Uh, make sure your bedroom is conducive to sleep. So dark, quiet, comfortable, and cooler than the rest of your house. Invest on a good mattress and pillow. We sleep about one third of our lives. So I think it's a good thing to have a good bedroom environment. Move, especially outside. The benefits of being active outside are even greater on your seat than being uh, active inside. So go outside, fresh air, vitamin D, all the benefits of connection with nature is good for you. But also it's probably the first tip I give to people are you active every day? You're at least 30 minutes per day of, uh, of exercise. And uh, if not, you should increase that. So there's a, a, a link to do with this physical inactivity epidemic we have in Canada with the sleep epidemic we have as well. So I think they're both connect, interconnected. We work with our brain a lot and we need to van. So I think we need to balance this mental activity with this physical activity. We have lots of burnout. We, uh, we, everyone is very busy. But I need, uh, it's important that we move for health. And sometimes you just go to bed and you just think about your, your next day. You're stressed out. You don't fall asleep. So I think it's important to be very active uh, for sleep. Uh, having a routine, is not, it's good not only for kids, but for adults. So wind down before bed, bathing, music, reading. But try to give up your screens in the one hour before bed. Uh, don't go to bed feeling hungry. Have a snack before bed, but not a steak with, with french fries. So a light snack is good. Don't have pets in your bedroom and reserve your bedroom for sleeping only. So keep gadgets uh, outside so it doesn't disrupt you. And I'll just finish. Uh, I think I'm in time. The last two, three slides. So a new study that we conducted at CHIO. So new findings, it's not published, but uh, at least you can uh, learn a bit about it. It's a, it was called Smart 2D Study, Sleep Manipulation in Adolescents at Risk of Type 2 Di Diabetes. So it's a, it's a randomized uh, crossover trial in adolescents at risk of type 2, so with impaired glucose tolerance. So the first week, they were sleeping uh, their habitual week at home, and we we're monitoring them with a risk and then they were randomized to either increase their uh, time in bed by 1.5 hours for one week or decrease by 1.5 hours for one week, wash out for one week, and then they did the other one, so either restriction or extension, and then we're testing them at the eight of all three sessions. So the, prescrip the prescription was time, time in bed, so they were either going to bed earlier or later. We're not changing wake up time because teenagers were going to school. So the only way to manipulate their sleep duration was to play with bedtime. So not with pills, but just behavior modification. So in the sleep extension arm, so the prescription was to sleep 1.5 hours more. So with the objective device, they slept 54 minutes more on average per night, which is pretty good. So we're telling them to go to bed 1.5 hours earlier and their actual sleep duration was about one hour more per night. And then the sleep restriction uh, to decrease by 1.5, it decreased by 80 minutes. So close to 1.5. So I think take home message, it's easier to restrict and to increase sleep, but it's possible to increase sleep. And by doing so, did we impact outcomes? Uh, so we can see uh, HOMO RI was improved, significantly improved in the increased sleep week, uh, but no differences with decreased sleep, probably because they already had impaired glucose tolerance, but at least we were able to increase their sleep. And by doing so, we can improve outcomes. So that was, and the match learning index will also improve in the increased sleep. And now we're looking at uh, many other outcomes like mental health, cognitive function, uh, 
eating behavior, stuff like that. So uh, I think my PhD student is just ready to write her papers for thesis, and that's going to be published in the coming months. So we're pretty excited about those, those findings. And I will just conclude that if you're inter interested in sleep, uh, two key organizations to look for are the Canadian Sleep Society, if you want evidence and form uh, information and sleep on it, which is a campaign more for advocacy. If you think about the participation for physical activity, but this is a bit the participation for, for sleep. So if you want to know about sleep myths or what about drinking before bed or shift working, melatonin use, all of those questions, you can find that in the sleep on it uh, website. And conclusion, uh, four take home messages for you. So wake up if you were sleeping, it was probably good for you to nap. So. Uh, uh, right after or during lunch. Progress has been made on the importance of a good night's sleep for all. Sleep health is a, an important factor to consider in the prevention and in the treatment of chronic diseases, both. The field of sleep is still dominated by the treatment of sleep disorders rather than their prevention in the first place. So I tried to push more for the public health aspects of sleep, which is pretty important. And we need leadership and innovation in translating, disseminating, and mobilizing sleep health uh, initiatives or strategies. So thank you very much. And yeah, 43 minutes, 40 minutes. So lots of time for questions. So thank you, merci. Thank you very much, Jean-Philippe. Merci beaucoup. Uh, yeah, as you said, a very good timing. So we have, uh, we have more than 15 minutes for questions. So this was a very interesting talk, very, uh, I think very, uh, very impactful in terms of um, applications that people can see in their, in their lives and the lives of their kids or teenagers. So that's uh, uh, something everyone can probably relate to. Uh, so if you do have questions for Dr. Chaput, please feel free to write them in the Q&A sections and I'm going to uh, read them uh, for you. So don't hesitate to do so. Um, so we do have a few questions to start with. First question is, where could we find those guidelines? Um, the guidelines for uh, sleep hours, I suppose, or that you that or that's, uh, what you yeah, mentioned. So the Canadian 24-hour movement guidelines. So CSEP, the Canadian mm -hmm. Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology. So CSEP.ca. This is the main uh, mm -hmm. organization. Or if you go to the participation website. So participation is an organization for physical activity. You can find them there. So either CSEP or participation will be the two key websites. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the same person that asked questions about what have Canada could do or should do to encourage and push policies, policy makers to really do something about uh, that, I guess about sleep. <laughs> any, do you have any, I mean, so just a little part of the question. I heard policymakers. What, what have Canada could do to encourage policymakers to really do something about sleep? Many things. I think. Uh, <clears throat> I think to invest more in it. I think it was pretty good. And with Tan, we're just applying to a team grant on sleep I think to increase research capacity and to change. Uh, to improve sleep of Canadians, I think the goal is that more Canadians sleep better and then will impact outcomes. I think at different levels, I think I was talking about uh, napping in the care setting to delay school start time for adolescents. I think in the workplace is a good place with wellness programs, uh, sleeping pods, uh, with sleep disorders to better uh, assess and treat sleep disorders. There's like many, many aspects to be done, but I think Compared to other risk factors, I think sleep has been not a black sheep, but uh, underfunded and uh, there's just less people working on it. So by default, it, the fact that it's not even part of the global burden of disease study uh, speaks to me quite a bit. So it means that we're far behind other fields. Uh, so there's still work to be done. We don't know everything, but we still know many things that we can intervene and come up with solutions. So I think to, just to increase research capacity, and I think now working with the government, because we have ev evidence-based sleep guidelines in Canada, the government is invested in uh, putting more money and also to, to help Canadians. So I think uh, I'm in contact every day with the Public Health Agency of Canada, with Health Canada, Statistics Canada. So they improve the surveillance, but also they want to fund public health aspects of sleep as well. So I think 
I see this coming and coming more and more in the, in the future, but those things take time. And I think as a society, we just need to value more sleep and less as a waste of time. So to change the social norm around it, I think there's could be campaigns or stuff like that that could be done to just value sleep more in, in our society. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jean-Philippe. I think that's a very broad question. It's difficult to address it, but uh, there are some, as you said, some, there are some initiatives being done at the federal level, at least, to fund certain initiatives, like the one you mentioned. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's something that uh, we could discuss for hours. So there's one interesting question about uh, wearable sensors. Uh, so some of you, uh, you might probably have heard about the Aura ring. Uh, that, that's uh, supposed to manage sleep to replace the subjective sleep quality questionnaire. What do you think? What's your opinion about the uh, Aura ring to manage sleep? <laughs> I don't know if you know about this ring? device. Yeah. yeah, I've never tested this device myself. So I think in the field of wearables, there are just so many different ones. I think more and more people are using them for different things. Uh, my mom loves Fitbit. Uh, there's Garmin, there's so many different things that can be used to track, yes, physical activity, but sleep. Uh, the Muse is one that you can put on your head as well. There's many of those devices. I think if you like them and it helps you, it can be a good thing, but sometimes it can play against you. Sometimes you just, you're more stressed out about it because you realize you don't sleep well. And then, so it depends. So if it helps you, yes, but if it hurts you, no. So it can be a good thing and bad thing. In research, I think some of them are not research grade, so we're not going to use them for research because they're not accurate enough. But more and more, we tend to use wearables to reach a large population. And it, in some cases, is better than self-reported sleep because you get a bit, a bit more objective information. And even there, I've seen some studies using cell phones. So people use their cell phones all the time to track physical activity or to track sleep. So there's many fine fine tuning to be done, but I see the feel of uh, technology to evolve in the years to come and we'll learn way more. And I think uh, mm. we should embrace more uh, the good things coming out and to leave the less good things. So I think on a case by case basis, it I think it can help people, but it may not help others. So it's really like me, I don't like gadget myself, but some people like them. So it's up to you. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, that's a very interesting topic. And I think that so we need to keep in mind that some, some of these devices are validated, or another, but most of them are not validated. So that they, we don't know how precise they are compared to standard SID metrics. So we always need to be careful about uh, the claims that, uh, uh, because these are usually commercial claims. And, uh, and we as scientists are trying to, try to uh, inform the public by validating those devices. That's, that, that's actually something that's part of uh, several, several research projects. So we'll, so stay tuned, but right now it's difficult to have a, one opinion because we don't know much about those devices. Um, Audrey is asking, have researchers ex examined the differences in sleep time quality or sleep quality in uh, populations such as those with, heart with cardiac uh, diseases uh, versus uh, healthy individuals? So sleep quality in population health studies has been mainly with self-reported sleep. So they tend to ask uh, to rate sleep quality. So from very bad to very good. So we have a sense of an indication of sleep quality. So we have that. And we, they tend to do subgroup analysis for different uh, segments of the population. So to, the goal is to target the high risk group. So we know like people from lower socioeconomic status and then Aboriginal people. So there's higher risk group for course duration and quality. Uh, but I think there's quite a bit of work to be done. The problem in Canada in recent cycles of the Canadian Health Measures Survey and Canadian Community Health Survey, the two biggest survey across Canada, they removed all SEEP questions from their surveys. So the past couple of years, we have not even one question about SEEP. We don't even know the duration of SEEP of Canadians. <clears throat> they removed them for different reasons. It was, I think, uh, bad timing. The people working on it were all on mat leave at the same time. And there were people with other competing and, and, and interests. And then those questions got removed. And then now they're just starting to bring them back. But we have a gap of many years now. So that's why uh, they did a rapid response survey in 2020 just to try and to get a snapshot of the SIP of Canadians. 
But the prob problem with rapid response survey, they cannot link that with any other outcomes. So it's just a description of sleep of Canadians, but you can't cannot make any correlation with mental health, physical health, or anything. It's just sleep of Canadians. So I think uh, that was a problem that was removed. So we don't we have a gap now. But what's coming in Canada for surveillance of SEEP is objective measures of SEEP. So for physical activity, people were wearing uh, the Actical accelerometer on their waist. But now to be a 24-hour protocol with the Acti graph, so we'll get information on physical activity, but SEEP of Canadians. So, and through that device, uh, we'll get information about timing, efficiency of your sleep, uh, sleep onset, and stuff like that. So we'll have more objective SEEP information that will complement the self-report. We'll have both self-report and objective in the coming years. But as of now, now in 2021, uh, there's nothing. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, yeah, this needs ongoing research. I guess that it depends on the population that you're, that you're asking for. There are some studies with uh, objective data on certain populations, but uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's, only, uh, it's only the beginning actually. So Emmanuel is asking, uh, well, he says, thanks for your nice presentation. He's asking if you've done any work on the association between sedentary behaviors and sleep. And if so, if you could briefly highlight some of your findings. Yeah, I did quite a bit of work on that. So uh, it's a bi-directional association between similar behavior and sleep. So the more your sedentary, the less you sleep and the less you sleep, the more your sedentary. So we did some prospective studies with so showing bi-directional association. Sedentary behavior includes a lot of things. So mainly it's when you're, you're sitting during the day. <clears throat> but within that center behavior piece, there's screen time activities and non-screen activities. So that means you can read a book for pleasure or you can watch TV. And it seems that the, the screen time part seems to be more uh, of a problem for the sleep than just sitting. And I think what's recent to show that you can compensate or offset some of the adverse effects of excess sitting time by moving more. So that means that probably in the future with physical active guidelines, what we see is that, let's say for adults, they say move 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day. But if you sit for 10 hours per day versus eight versus six, so the amount of physical activity you need will be different. So for people that sit more, they may need to move more. If you sit less, you may need to move less. So there'll be some... Uh, more per, per personalized approaches to public health because we're all different, but there's a clear observation is that we tend to sit more and, and then to engage in more screen time. So by default, we really need to move more, but yeah, there's a, it's on both ways, those associations. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a, a question from uh, Melody who is asking, um, because you mentioned the, um, uh, the, uh, the range of sleep hours, you mentioned that the SM does not comment on the range of sleep, but the only sleep indicates sleep gradients of seven hours per night. Uh, and, but the National Sleep Foundation does actually do some breakdown of the ranges of sleep hours per age, with, for example, for adults is eight to nine hours. So you can maybe comment on, the, on this, Maybe I know there are some differences between guidelines in terms of uh, the number of hours that are recommended. <clears throat> so we yeah, had the National Sleep Foundation recommendation that ranges by age group, which is pretty similar to what we have in Canada. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine, as I said, they, they recommend seven hours or more for adults, so no upper limit. And they use the same process as the National Sleep Foundation. So. Uh, the difference is that they had different experts at the table and they were saying that uh, there's no mechanism that can explain why long sleep can cause ill health. So by default, we'll not recommend an upper limit for long sleep. We'll just say seven or more. doesn't matter how long you sleep. So I guess it's a matter of both could be fine with the range. As I said, the one good thing that I see is that if you sleep way more than the upper limit, it can be a signal for something else going wrong to screen for underlying conditions or diseases like chronic pain or depression or something else. And it signals probably poor sleep quality. So spending a lot of time in bed 
but not being efficient in your sleep. So I think it's important for the clinician to know that. <clears throat> so it's really, uh, but there's not many sleep recommendation around the world. So it's mainly Canadian and American and that's it mainly. So that's why I was pushing more to have more global guidelines from WHO that will help. And when I was there uh, last year to do the physical activity guidelines in Geneva for WHO, I was pushing to have 24 guidelines with that. And then their mandate was to update their physical activity guidelines from 2010 to 2020. But the mandate was just physical activity. So they didn't want to include sleep because it was very different and they didn't have the expert at the table, which I understood and asked them, are you planning on having steep guidelines at some point? And he said, I, it would be nice, but I guess it depends on, on money and stuff like that. So I, have, I don't know if it's going to come, but uh, it's just sad mm -hmm. that they didn't want to include steep as well, because it would have helped yeah. many other countries in like Canada, yeah. US or two high income countries. But we, the world is Africa, is Asia. There's many parts of the world that would benefit from more guidance from the WHO <clears throat> because other countries will not use Canadian guidelines or US guidelines. They may not, not apply everywhere. So I think, yeah, more research is needed, but I think it uh, would have been nice for the WHO to, to value and to have uh, CEP recommendations, but maybe in the future. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know that the, uh, you were involved in that uh, WHO discussion. So, and it means that we need some more stronger some stronger lobbying <laughs> to yeah. get sleep at the table of WHO. It's uh, fortunate that it's not there yet. Yeah. Um, uh, Amanda uh, is asking, based on circadian, with, circadian rhythms, is there an optimal bedtime for young children when they are physiologically more prepared to fall asleep? The what? The circadian rhythms? Is that based on their uh, circadian rhythms, uh, do you think there's an optimal bedtime for young children to go to bed at the moment where they're physiologic physiologically more prepared to fall asleep? <clears throat> yeah, I guess all kids are different, depends on the age of your, child, of your kid as well. So I think what you try to aim, uh, because to meet the sleep duration recommendations, they have to wake up at a certain time. So if you know that, the wake up cannot be after 6 30 you try to aim to meet that but all kids are different i think what i see now with my daughter she, she's three and, and a half uh, and she sleeps at daycare but she she, uh, she naps at daycare but she never naps uh, on weekends here so when she naps at daycare on weekdays she doesn't want to go to bed that night she goes to bed at like eight 8 30 or 9 p.m but it's, it's too late for her so then i would like her not to nap at daycare and to preserve nighttime sleep, which is the most critical one. Um, so I think that for younger kids, the napping part will be a key one to me to, to address. And so when is a good time to stop napping and um, even though all kids are different, but uh, there's many studies showing that after two years of age or three, uh, napping can impede nighttime sleep, which is not a good thing. Uh, and then, of course, you need to prepare the, the routine towards bedtime that uh, brushing your teeth, PG on and a bit of uh, reading, stuff like that. So the body is more prepared to go to bed. So those associations that we do for adults as well. So the body is more ready when you go to bed that you're, you're tired and you fall asleep quicker. But of course, if you go to bed wired and not tired, uh, you're not going to fall asleep. And of course, uh, it can be very long for kids, but same for adults as well. So if you go to bed, not tired at all, uh, you don't want to be in bed for one hour and not falling asleep because you think mm -hmm. about it and then you're not falling asleep and then uh, you're anxious about it. And Tan can tell you he works on insomnia and uh, that can happen to anyone. So uh, even my wife recently uh, has a very hard time to fall asleep and she has always been a good sleeper. So things can change every time, even for good sleepers. Yeah, things change with age and uh, even uh, starting in their 30s or 40s and I can also <laughs> testify on that myself. So there's a lot more questions, but I think we've reached our 1 p.m. time and then I won't have the time to go over the, all of them. Um, so, uh, so I'd like to conclude our uh, colloquium here, and I thank uh, I want to thank Jean Philippe uh, very much for his time and for his uh, great presentation. Um, so, thank uh, Wendy for the organization of this colloquium, and uh, and I thank you to all of you for attending this presentation. I hope you've gained some uh, new insight into the importance of sleep, and we both 
also to promote uh, the importance of sleep within your networks and families. Okay, so thank you everyone. Uh, thank you again, Jean-Philippe, and uh, have a nice afternoon and rest of your day. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye.